developed its industry, economy, and culture. It was about 150 years ago that Japan began to set sail upon the oceans of the world. This was the start of Japan's voyage to the future, when it reinvented itself as an advanced nation. Trade secured the materials and resources it needed. The Tokyo University of Mercantile Marine, the forerunner of today's Faculty of Marine Technology of the Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology, supported Japan's efforts as a nation to expand the maritime and shipping industry. Now, 140 years later, the Faculty of Marine Technology continues to serve Japan's ever-changing needs by producing outstanding personnel. With a multifaceted, comprehensive education embracing the ocean, shipping and logistics, graduates are ready for the challenges of today's internationally competitive world. They include experts trained to ensure shipping operates safely and efficiently. Engineers proficient in all the mechanical systems surrounding this. And logistics specialists who understand the flow of goods and information from the point of production to the point of consumption and design the best distribution systems to match. Bringing all these specialist areas together, the faculty produces graduates with a broad outlook and a high degree of professionalism. The Faculty of Marine Technology employs a range of approaches to develop a bright new future from the limitless potential of the ocean. Underwater robots for seabed exploration to investigate the possibilities of next generation energy. And technical innovation in ship propulsion systems to mitigate environmental impacts. And with multifaceted development of distribution systems expanding throughout our everyday lives, the potential of marine engineering is extending beyond the ocean to the land and to the air. For more than 140 years, the Faculty of Marine Technology has developed the personnel needed to exploit Japan's seas and shaped our futures from the sea. In addition to supporting the maritime activities of Japan, the Faculty of Marine Technology is committed to producing global leaders trained to excel in a range of areas on the world stage. Producing personnel with advanced technological expertise contributes to the betterment of mankind. This is the mission of the Faculty of Marine Technology of the Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology. Japan's one and only comprehensive maritime university. New social systems are created by integrating humanity's diverse accumulation of knowledge, spanning the ages, and all manner of places. Here are some examples. Research into an optical lattice clock that deviates only one second every 30 billion years. This ultra-precise clock can detect the delay in time caused by very small differences in gravitational energy. Scholars researching Buddhist scriptures with a 2,000-year history are creating a database of Asia's vast wealth of Buddhist knowledge. Research into functional, beautiful, artificial legs 
will make it possible for the human body and its synthetic parts to become perfectly synchronized. But these are only a few examples of excellent research going on at the University of Tokyo. The University of Tokyo was founded 140 years ago as Japan's first national university. Today it comprises campuses in Tokyo and the Chiba area, along with labs and research forests across Japan. Three campuses are central to education and research Hongo, Kumaba, and Kashiwa. Over 3,000 new undergraduates, including international students, enter the University of Tokyo each year. Whether they major in the arts or the sciences, all commence their studies here at the Komaba campus. Every new student enjoys the opportunities of learning, covering all fields across the sciences, humanities, and social sciences that help develop competency in logical thinking. Peak classes are conducted in English. These programs, though primarily designed for international students, are open to all undergraduates. As students with diverse backgrounds interact and take on new challenges, they gain a wider perspective of their place in the world. For three days in late November, over 100,000 people gather for the lively Komaba Festival. Our students enjoy actively taking part in the festivities. The Hongo campus is the main setting for specialized education and research. Traditions dating back to the university's early days and cutting-edge research coexist on this campus. Sanshiro Pond, named after a novel by Natsume Soseki, dates back to when the present site was a feudal lord's residential garden. Statues of educators from overseas can be found in various areas of the campus. They are professors who were invited to teach at the university early in its history. The university did not simply imitate or transplant Western civilization. Instead, the University of Tokyo reorganized the most advanced contemporary thought and technology, incorporating them into a unique academic framework. For example, the University of Tokyo recognized engineering as an academic discipline and was the first to incorporate it into formal university education. Mathematics teaching at the Faculty of Engineering became the cornerstone of an education to instill individuals with advanced cognitive and technical skills. However, the University of Tokyo's history has not always been smooth sailing. The agonizing experience of war threatened to undo this bastion of scholarship. The university today is shaped by overcoming this painful experience. Each University of Tokyo campus has its own main library, along with specialized libraries dedicated to each faculty and institute. The libraries are a trove of over 9.4 million volumes, from basic to specialized titles as well as rare books, including national treasures. 
At the heart of this network is the Hongo campus's general library. Renovations here are underway and a new wing is being added to the facility. The Kashiwa campus opened in 1999. This state-of-the-art campus is geared to so-called intellectual adventure with the idea of fundamentally rearranging the academic system. Every day, when the clock strikes three at the Kavli Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe, researchers from various fields gather at the Piazza Fujiwara for tea. These researchers from different disciplines throw themselves into lively discussion as they fill up on tea and cookies. This open debate outside the confines of their respective fields breeds fresh ideas, leading to new research. The director of the Kashiwa campus's Institute for Cosmic Ray Research is Takaaki Kajita, a winner of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. The detection of gravitational waves is the most important goal for me at the moment. In Kamioka, we are constructing a large underground detector called Kagura. If we detect gravitational waves, we will be able to observe the very moment of black hole formations and supernova explosions. Because Kagura and Super Kamioka are located close to each other, perhaps we'll observe gravitational waves and neutrinos at the same time. So I look forward to observing gravitational waves in Kagura. At this instant, world-class research across diverse fields is going on at the University of Tokyo. Transcending disciplines and even time, and reaching across borders between East and West, diversity of knowledge yields synergies that enable a yet higher level of excellence. The University of Tokyo will take the lead in proposing a new social system, collaborating with people from all walks of life, taking a long-term perspective as only a university can. Partnerships with the private sector are one form of this approach. In fields such as artificial intelligence and sports science, we have already set foot on the path to collaboration. The world now is at a turning point. We seek a future where each of us can make full use of our individual strengths to read free and active lives, realizing a society that balances development with harmony. The University of Tokyo has great reserves of knowledge cultivated over our 140-year history. We will contribute to bringing about such a society by creating new knowledge and exploiting our great resources. For that purpose, the University of Tokyo aspires to be a global base for knowledge collaboration, a venue for people from diverse backgrounds and all generations to share knowledge and take action together.
This is Indonesia. A land of immeasurable diversity. A land that offers vast opportunities. This is the nexus of hopes and aspirations from across the archipelago. Bersama kami berikan kontribusi nyata lewat inovasi, karya cipta, dan pencapaian lain sesuai bidang ilmu. Dari UI, untuk Indonesia yang toleran, unggul, dan bermartabat. Welcome to Universitas Indonesia. Since our beginnings, Universitas Indonesia has been continually evolving and building upon our achievements. We have become the biggest, best, and leading university in Indonesia and also Asia. Here at Universitas Indonesia, the best and brightest from across the region come to study. From diverse backgrounds, we build an intellectual community that enriches and enhances humanity. For superior generations, Universitas Indonesia provides world-class learning facilities. We implement state-of-the-art technology for research and industrial development. accessible to all, also to the disabled. This is our commitment for realizing an inclusive educational environment. Universitas Indonesia is fully supported by environmentally friendly transportation and sustainable energy systems. We take pride in being a green and sustainable campus. Universitas Indonesia partners with relevant stakeholders to facilitate and provide ease of comfort for day-to-day -day activities for all our academic community. We recognize that each individual is unique, with unique talents and interests. As such, Universitas Indonesia provides opportunities for every individual to develop themselves to their fullest. Universitas Indonesia provides and fully supports students with great facilities and activities so that students are able to develop and grow to become their best. Together, we embrace our diversity to grow the future together. For Indonesia, for the world. Universitas Indonesia Unity in Diversity Universitas Indonesia Veritas Probitas Justicia Asia, with its vast and steady growth, has turned itself into the leader of global economy. Indonesia, with its strategic position, has the chance to take the major role in this era. In order to build global partnerships and counteract the threats, strategic policies should be taken. 
to enhance the nation's competitive advantage, further approach through in-depth, comprehensive studies and researches are crucial. With our long history, has proved ourselves to be a reliable academic institution. After successfully adapting into distinct programs, in 2016, officially the program turned into School of Strategic and Global Studies. School of Strategic and Global Studies Universitas Indonesia contributes the cause by producing qualified human resources and studies. Situated in the heart of Jakarta, the School of Strategic and Global Studies provides a variety of courses on multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary studies at the master's levels. In my humble opinion, I can say that I have a good impression at the first sight. An atmosphere and ambience here support us to gain more and achieve more other than merely classes and handouts. I think that is a very promising because of the multidisciplinary approach that Universitas Indonesia offers us to study. For another reason, the situation that I actually got in in the classes is a lot of interesting current issues that we're talking about, so it's academically fulfilling for me. With dedicated and qualified lecturers from academic and practical background, School of Strategic and Global Studies Universitas Indonesia produce scholars and practitioners that will ready for global challenges. Together, we build the nation for a better world.
IS, University of Tokyo, Professor Nobuaki Kubo, Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology, Kamsat, and also Mr. Kaito Kobayashi, Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology. Uh, distinguished guests, respective participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Universitas Indonesia is a comprehensive campus that covers the wide array of scientific disciplines. The School of Strategic and Global Studies is a leading university. Universitas Indonesia, a postgraduate program with multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary approach that carries forward research innovation to enhance the vision and mission of Universitas Indonesia to be a world-class university. Um, the Global Navigation Satellite System, or GNSS, is one of the explored technologies in SSGS UI. We have explored GNSS technology for academic and research activities since 2015. Besides the development of spatial technology based research, international collaboration is our strategic agenda to maximize the use of GNSS. In order to achieve this target, SSGS creates a range of programs, including seminars and workshops. This year, SSGS UI presents webinar and training series entitled GNSS Applications for Urban Environment. That also introduces GNSS Medoka technology as the new method to explore in our academic and research activities. I would like to express my high appreciation to our dear partner, SIS, the University of Tokyo, and Amsterdam, University of Japan, for delivering this global series of webinar and training in these two days' event. Then, my deep respect to all guests participants and audiences. We are honored to have you today. We hope this event contributes positive insights to all of us. Of course, this webinar and training also open and strengthen good collaboration with those who knock opportunities to work with us. With this, I officially open this SSGS UICNSS webinar and training 2022. Please, Enjoy the event. Thank you. Very good afternoon and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Yes, I'm here. So I was blocked. I could not unmute myself. <laughs> yeah. Now, now it's okay. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can Can I start now? Okay. Okay. So. First of all, so the, thank you very much for uh, organizing this uh, event. I think this is very important. Um, and we, we, we had a series of this type of webinar in the past year. And we, I think we have uh, several this type of webinar on different topics. And this time, this time is a bit a new concept on Madoka. So probably many of you don't know what is Madoka. And this is quite interesting technology or new type of uh, G GPS surveying method, or it, it's actually based on the QGS Japanese satellite uh, system. Uh, so today we are going to have uh, two, I, I'm going to have two presentations. One is on the very basic GNSS theory. Uh, I suppose that many of you already know what is GNSS, but uh, some of you may be new. So the first part will be more on the introductory type. So those who already know, maybe it's a little bit uh, duplication for them, uh, but those who don't know, probably they have to understand it to understand what is Madoka and why do we need it and how it provides the high accuracy. And the second part is about some applications uh, for construction monitoring, site construction site monitoring, and so on, about RTK high accuracy. That is by Professor Kubo, but unfortunately he's not available today. So I'm also going to do that part uh, on behalf of him. Uh, let me select my one. Okay, so let me start my talk. Uh, you probably hear this word called GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite System. Uh, normally we are used to with the word called GPS or GLONASS from GPS is from uh, USA and GLONASS from Russia. And now there are so many other systems called Galileo from Europe and Beidou from China and QGSS from Japan and Navig from India. So this QGSS also has a nickname called Michibiki. Sometimes you hear QGSS, sometimes Michibiki. Yes. So, but, but it's the same thing. Also Beidou is a BDS. In some documents you see BDS and some document you see Compass. So this is uh, what uh, we see in various documents. And also NAVIC is an Indian system. And here we have uh, IR and SS. Okay. And these are the systems that's currently available. Six different systems from six different countries. And if you look at here, GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Beidou, they are global. Means it provides the service all over the world. However, QZ and Navi, they are regional, means you don't see this uh, around the world. Only some region you can use it, but uh, other places you can't. For example, this QZ is visible in Japan and Asian region, Asia and Oceania, but not in Africa, USA, or Europe. Okay. So this is the difference. And here, this summarized chart, this figure shows that all the signals that's coming from the satellite. You know that the GPS or GNSS is by using the satellite. The satellite broadcasts some signal, special signal, and that will be used to compute the position data. And here, 
you will see some figures called L1, E1, D1, or L6, L2, L5. These represent the band. We call the frequency bands. Okay? Actually, it representing some frequency that is coming from the satellite, the signal frequency, like a radio, AM, FM, something like that. Okay? M band, F band, long wave, short wave, medium wave. So it's very much similar like that. That re actually represent the frequency values. So this L1 is at the one five seven five megahertz, L2 is at one two two seven megahertz, and so on. Uh, when you buy a receiver, so normally a very simple receiver is L1. Okay, this uh, frequency band. So this is the most common and the basic receiver. But if you want to have a high accuracy receiver for a uh, specific application like uh, mapping or geodetic survey or doing a high accuracy survey of centimeter level, then you need at least two frequency receiver, L1 and L2. Okay? So these are common receiver, L1, L2 for, uh, for high accuracy. Yeah. Uh, and then, for very specific services or high accuracy, like uh, for Japanese satellite, is the L6. This is the L6. This is the Japanese satellite, QGSS here. And Madoka is broadcasted in this signal. Okay. So this is what we need. So if you want to have a Madoka, uh, uh, Madoka signal, you need a receiver that is capable to receive Madoka signal. That means you need a receiver in L6 band. And there are also new signals coming up called L5 in the L5 band. And they also provide a better accuracy, better services, but you need an L5 capable receiver. That means today the, there are so many signals and when you want to purchase a receiver, you really need to select which one you want to use. But sometimes it's not your choice because if you want to buy a receiver, it's already there. However, uh, the cost will matter. Okay? If you want to have everything, the cost will be very high. But if you want to do just RTK or just a high accuracy survey, survey, maybe L1, L2 or L1, L5 may be enough or L1, L2 and L6 may be enough. So it depends on what type of applications you want, you want to use and how you want to use and what accuracy you are expecting. So it all depends on these factors. And based on that, you have to choose a receiver. Otherwise, you lose, uh, you 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 spend a lot of money for the things that you are not going to use. So these are some of the things that we need to consider: what type of receiver we should use for what type of application. But this is very difficult to decide because uh, sometimes you may be using a receiver for a different purpose. As far as you have a. Uh, uh, you have a clear target how to use, you can decide. But for education and research purpose, probably we, we'd like to have everything. And then it becomes very expensive. So that's the point where we are working. So we'd like to have L1, L2, L5, L6, but at a very low cost. And this uh, will show you today how this can be done or how this is done. And this slide shows that uh, shows some of the systems. Uh, it's not only GNSS, but also there are some other systems to improve or to provide better service or better accuracy for GNSS. And we call them augmentation systems. So this augmentation system, what it does is that it provides some additional information to the GNSS uh, satellite, I mean data which is uh, you process in the receiver. So inside the receiver, you are processing the data coming from the satellite to compute the position data, velocity data, or time. But to improve this accuracy to some level, we can also assist some additional data so that you have a better accuracy and better reliability. You can trust that this accuracy is within one or three meters, something like that. So this type of augmentation system, we call augmentation system. 
And this is basically done by providing the data from the satellite again. But this is not a GPS satellite, but this is just a uh, other satellite, like a communication satellite. They have a special frequency, which is uh, within this uh, GNSS band in the L1. And they provide additional information to improve the accuracy to some level. So this is called SBUS. And if you look at the receiver, you will see this word many times, SBUS, and which satellite to use. Okay? So this is one thing. And many countries, they have their own SBUS uh, system. So now we are talking two things. One is GNSS, the another one is SBUS. GNSS is to provide you the poisoning services, but the SBUS is to improve that poison service to some level. And many countries, you can see here, USA, Japan, Europe, China, India, and Russia, they already have their own SBUS system to improve the poisoning accuracy from the GNSS satellite. And also new systems are coming up like Korea and also Australia, New Zealand, Australia, Nigeria, Algeria. Okay. So Korea, they are also going to launch their own navigation satellite. Like in future, you will see like a CAS, K -A -S -S, or Korea navigation system, something like a Korean version of a GPS. So you will see this in maybe in around 2030, after 10 years, maybe. But anyway, they are going to have also SBUS and Australia, they are already working it. Nigeria, it's already launched, but uh, I don't know how it is operating. And Algeria, they are in the process to have their own SBUS satellite as well. So similarly, Indonesia may, may require such type of SBUS because this type of system is, I think it's enough for the other countries as well. The signals are visible and it's freely available. There's no control at all now. So all the civilian application is possible using so many satellites. You will see 50, 60 satellites now. This is enough. And it's not that easy or that, I mean, the operation of operation and maintenance cost is too much for this type of system. But if you want to improve the accuracy a little bit for different types of applications like agriculture, marine, transport, and for aviation by regulation, it, it, it requires uh, by ICAO. So this SBUS is also very important. Maybe in future, we don't know, maybe Indonesia may be in interested to have their own satellite. And this can be done just by having one or two satellites. That's enough. Just one or two satellites for a country. Like Japan, they have only two satellites. And Australia, they are going to have one satellite. Nigeria one, Algeria one. So this will improve the accuracy of the overall GNSS in your region. So that this may be one, one uh, technology or one system that Indonesia may be interested in future. I think the... I don't know whether this type of discussion is going on or not, but uh, I think this is necessary, especially uh, because uh, Indonesia has a very huge waterland. You have a large area of sea, and also you have a huge network of uh, aviation aircrafts. So ICAO, uh, they require by regulation to have a uh, uh, some sort of SPAS uh, assisted GPS system in the aircraft. And if you look at some receiver or the software that uh, connects to the receiver to read the data, uh, even for a very low cost, like a hundred dollar receiver, this is for a hundred dollar receiver from UBlox. And if you look at the software, you can see all the satellites here. Okay. So even the very low cost system, they can receive all the satellite signals. GPS, SBUS, Galileo, Beidou, QZ, GLONASS. Of course, this IR and SS is a, a NAVIC. So this is the old name, new name is NAVIC. It's not yet implemented, but it will be done in future. So the thing is that even this type of low cost receiver system, it can receive so many signals, but this receiver is only for L1 band. Okay? That's why we see only L1, E1, B1, signals, not other L2 or L5 or L6. 
And here you see so many satellites, it's too crowded now. Uh, you see 30, 40 satellites nowadays. And also you see, the, this is for dual frequency or two bad receiver, L1 and L2. Even this is uh, not a high end, but uh, it's, a, it's a high end, but low cost. Uh, it's about $300, so $400. So even the few hundred dollar receiver is now getting very, very strong and they are capable to provide accuracy of 10 to 20 centimeter. So the trend of GNS technology has uh, have already changed. You don't need to purchase a 2000, 3000, $5,000 receiver to have a high accuracy nowadays. So even the low cost system, it can provide. And to have a high accuracy data, uh, we need to have a special data processing that's, uh, that we are going to discuss from now on. So some of these receiver, it can provide such type of special data that is necessary for high accuracy. We call the raw data, means the shoot arrays and the carry phase. So this type of data is provided by such a low cost receiver system. And then you can still, uh, you can get a very high accuracy using a special signal processing technique called RTK or PPP. And then the accuracy will be about 10 to 20 centimeter but you need this type of output. And this chart shows, this slide shows the, that's the number of visible satellites in different regions, I mean, the different countries. So here is Jakarta, where you are now uh, in the campus. So we have what this receiver in the campus uh, at the university, uh, Salimba campus. We have a receiver here. We also have receiver in Bangkok, Manila, Kuala Lumpur, and Vietnam, and also Maputo, and several other places, but I don't have a list here. And if you look at the data, for example, you log the data for 24 hours and see how data looks like or how the satellite travels uh, over your head. So this is uh, quite interesting data for me because Japan is located in the northern hemisphere. Okay? The latitude is north. So if a country is in the northern hemisphere, you don't see much GPS satellite towards north direction. Okay? You do see it, but you don't see at a high elevation. This is what it shows. Okay? So if you go very, very north, then you see very little satellites uh, at a higher elevation you will see the satellite almost at the horizon. So if you see the satellites near the horizon, your accuracy is very bad. It, you don't get a, high, a good accuracy. But uh, this is the satellite orbit design, so you can't do anything on that. Uh, and if you see the location of Jakarta, so it's, uh, I think, about a little bit south. Uh, that's why we don't see a little bit on north, a uh, little bit on the south. Okay. So what I want to say is that the countries like uh, Indonesia, so it's very nicely located and you see maximum number of satellites at a very good visibility. So you can use the opportunity or availability of these satellites for many different types of applications. Yeah. So you, you don't probably need your old satellite systems. And on top of that, if you have one SMAS satellite or if you can do some augmentation technique, either space-based or ground-based, the accuracy will be much, much better. So these are basic backgrounds of uh, GNSS, and uh, I will show a few slides how it works. So this one is, uh, I think this is animation, yeah. So this is a satellite, okay. The satellite is sending a special signal, and this signal is uh, special in the meaning that it is designed in such a way that we can measure or we can count the pulses in this signal. Here. We have a special signal called PRN code, and this PRN code is a sort of a random pulses designed, defined by a specific rule. And if we can find out when the pulse start and where the pulse end, 
and how many these pieces of pulses are coming from the satellite to the receiver. If we can count that, then we can know the time delay, or we can compute the time from the satellite to the receiver. So this one pulse, for example, for example, this one pulse length, not a pulse length, one signal, one chunk of signal is one millisecond long. And then the receiver will count how many these chunks of the signal it enters into the receiver at certain time interval. And also it knows where is the start and where is the end. So by looking at the start and end points, the receiver counts how much, how many these uh, pieces of the signal and how long it took from the start to the end when it just uh, trans transmits here and when it enters. So the receiver can measure this by doing some special signal processing inside the receiver. And if it can be done, the receiver knows the time to travel this signal from satellite to the receiver. And if we know that time, then we can convert the distance by multiplying by velocity of light. Okay? And then you get the distance. And once you know the distance from satellite to the receiver, then you can compute the position of this, uh, this receiver. So this is the basic uh, fundamental theory of uh, fundamental of the GPS uh, principle or GADSS. So all the GADS system works like this. For example, in this case, if when it transmits, so it takes a 67 millisecond to transmit from satellite to the receiver. So you multiply 67 millisecond by the velocity of light, and that will be around 20,000 kilometer. Now, if you know the distance from the satellite to the receiver, from one satellite and another satellite, so in total four satellites we need, then you can compute the position of this receiver. Now this receiver position, we don't know, X0, Y0, Z0, this is unknown. Uh, but to compute the position of this, we need to know the position of these satellites. Okay. So this, the position of these satellites are given into the navigation message. We call, we say the navigation message into this signal. The satellite is sending, this is, this is my orbit at this time T. In this information coming all the time from the satellite to the receiver. And by using that type of uh, information, we can compute, we can uh, get the, this uh, satellite position data, X, S, Y, S, and Z, S. And if you know the satellite's position, uh, and then if you know the distance okay, by measuring the time delay or travel time from satellite to the receiver, you can that compute the X0. Uh, this X0 means the position of the receiver. So this is the mathematics. But what is under the top here is the time. We really don't know what time at this moment uh, in the receiver. So time is unknown here. So we also have a one unknown X0, Y0, Z0 at the time T. And this T is included here along with other errors. So we have four unknowns. That's the reason why we need uh, at least four satellites. So minimum four satellites we need it to, to compute the patient data. So that means if you want to launch your own satellite system, you should have at least four satellites visible uh, from your receiver. So in order to make four satellites, then you have to find out how many satellites you have to launch because satellites are always moving and you may be computer Poison data at any time you want. So you probably need many, many satellites. So that's the reason GPS has, a, I think there are 32 satellites in this space. And when you have 32 satellites, you will see uh, at the most uh, 10 satellites in many places around the world. Okay. So out of 10, you can use any uh, good satellites. You can use uh, out of 10, probably you can use all 10, or you can use uh, six or seven satellites to compute the position data. But anyway, you need more than four. And this slide shows the how 
the poison data is uh, computed and what accuracy we can get. And also something like how, when we talk about how to improve the accuracy, then we have to look a little bit into the business structure as well. But, but these are both technical things. And uh, I think in this lecture, I don't want to go all the details, but just remember that the some keywords, you just need to remember pseudo range. Okay. Many times you hear pseudo range, carry phase, these are some keywords. So please remember that when we say pseudo range, this is the code phase measurement. So what is code phase measurement is that the satellite is transmitting this type of pulses. We call the PR code that you saw in the previous slide. It's a sort of a zeros and ones of pulses. It's coming up from the satellite. And we measure the pulse zeros and ones. And when the receiver is working, the receiver is also generating its own GPS-like signal inside the receiver in the pulses. And that is trying to align the signal generated here and the signal coming from the satellite. And in this aligning process, this has to be brought forward or backward because this start point is released at the antenna of the satellite and it has to travel 20,000 kilometers to the arc. During this time, there will be some delay, okay? So to match that delay, the pulses you generate in the receiver, you have to uh, move forward or backward, okay? When you do this, at, that, at some time, these two pulses, these two signals, they match exactly after doing this type of shift. And this shift will tell you the distance actually. Okay? This is the, Delay, we call it delay, but delay is the distance. So delay is the time you multiply the by the velocity of light, then you get a distance. So actually, we are calculating the uh, time uh, taken from satellite to the receiver by doing this type of uh, signal generation in the receiver and comparing this signal with the signal coming from the satellite. Okay, and this process we compute a delay, and that that delay is called the pseudo range or the quote phase measurement. Okay? This is the pseudo range. So by doing this type of pseudo range measurement, so we can do the position computation, but that position has always uh, different types of error. And if you want to improve the error, uh, I mean the accuracy, you have to remove those errors. So next we'll see how to improve that uh, accuracy. And we, we saw that the, the signal is coming from the satellite all the time continuously to the receiver. Yeah. Now the satellite has different types of error. One is the orbit error, satellite orbit error, and also the it has a satellite clock error. And all the GPS satellites, GPS or QGSS, Galileo, GLONASS, they are very well designed. So they travel along the, the specified orbit. And also the clock, they have an atomic clock. It's very highly accurate atomic clock. So it has a very, very small error. But nevertheless, still it, it has a very small error and that error will affect maybe one to two meters of uh, accuracy. So that we have to remove. So we need to remember that there are two errors coming here from the satellite, orbit error and the clock error. And then the signal is traveling through the space. And in the space, we have the, the ionospheric impact on the signal, uh, this will cause some delay uh, on the signal and also some tropospheric delay. This is uh, about like a water vapor in the atmosphere. So it, it has a very small impact on that. And due to these uh, effects, it will create some error in the receiver, uh, in the measurement of the poison data in the receiver. Yeah. So if we can remove these errors, your accuracy will improve. So this is the fundamental thing. The problem is now how to remove this type of error, how to remove this error. Okay, there are two things. One is satellite related, one is the, this path in the space, atmospheric and tropospheric. So how to remove this one? And this multi-part is reflected by nearby objects, buildings, trees, and so on. We can't do anything on this because this is, it depends on the location where you are logging the data. But at least we can remove this error 
uh, these type of errors, uh, these type of errors. So this, this is a very clear picture, how much error you are having it. For example, if I have a receiver, you connect the antenna, you go to the field, log on the data for a few hours, you will get this type of uh, poisoning accuracy. You plot the scatter plot X and Y, lat long data, uh, accuracy data, error data. It will be like that. And this accuracy you see here is a 50 centimeter grid. Uh, that will be about uh, maybe three to five meters accuracy, this one, I suppose. Okay. Of course, you can take a bead of this, but uh, you see it's not like uh, these blue dots. So it's going all the way scattered here, then moving slowly here and here, and it's wandering <laughs> something like this, around this. And this will be about three to five meters accuracy. And today, GNSS accuracy, GPS, for example, GPS is guaranteed to provide you about 10 meters of accuracy. So it doesn't matter, even if you have a $10,000 receiver, your accuracy will be like this. You don't get centimeter from $10,000 receiver unless you do data processing to remove the errors. So this error removing process is very important. <laughs> so you should not expect uh, using $10,000 receiver to have a centimeter accuracy without doing the error correction technique. That's a must. <laughs> and this data is the same. We log the data and we don't do any error correction technique here. This is just a standard observation, like a normal GPS. And then <laughs> we did some error correction here. But this error correction does not remove all the errors. So we call it a fourth phase observation using a differential GPS or DGPS technique. This is very commonly used uh, standard uh, error correction technique by using differential GPS. Yeah. And this is also very much similar to SBAS uh, augmentation. So if you provide some additional information using the SBAS satellite, you will get something like these blue dots yeah, from red to blue. So, but this accuracy is still not very high. It's uh, about one to three meters accuracy you get it. So uh, the DGPS is about uh, one to three meters accuracy. It's definitely much improved from these rates, but it's not that level. Of course, if you take a bead of this, it's much, much better, but this is valid uh, for a static case then. If you move, it's, it's a different issue. So if you move, it will be anywhere any of this point maybe your observation data. And if we want to have a very high accuracy of cent centimeter, like a two centimeter, like this, then you need to do a different type of signal processing called RTK, real-time kinematic. So this RTK use both code phase and carrier phase data. I wrote here carrier phase, but also it used the code phase. So we did both code phase and carrier phase data. Of course, code phase is the minimum requirement to compute the poison data. But we also need the carrier phase data now. And this becomes more complex to process the data. But what you get is the high accuracy. Now it's the same data, the same red points. From red, we go to blue, and from blue, we can go to green. It's not necessary that you go from red to blue and green. Uh, if you do RTK, it will be from red to green directly. Okay. So the accuracy is about two centimeter here. So now we look at this table, why we can get that level of accuracy? Because I showed you before that there are some errors called the satellite orbit error, clock error, ionospheric error, and tropospheric error, and multipath error. Uh, by doing differential correction technique or this type of a DGPS or RTK, we can remove these errors. Okay? So satellite orbit error and clock error, we can remove completely. We can make it almost zero. And ionospheric and tropospheric, we can minimize this. Okay? So we can minimize to, we can't make it completely zero, but it can be minimized to a very small value. So now you can see two to four and about so five meters error here, five plus four, nine meters error is reduced to about half a meter. And if you look at this, so you can clearly see the removal of four and five, about four to five meters of error here in this one. Okay. So 
this is about maybe five meters like that, then you go to a few centimeters here. So that means we could remove this type of error to a large extent. So this is what we have to do. But in order to do this, it's not that easy. So it becomes very complex. So what is complex is, yeah. So how to remove or minimize common errors? So in that case, you need a base station. Now we come to the new terminology called base station or reference station or course. So we have a different name for that. Now the data I showed for the, the satellite data before is uh, that's our base station at the uh, University of Indonesia. It's continuously observing the G GPS signal, GNSS signals, all the satellite signals is observing continuously. And if you have that type of station, you can send this observation data to other receiver in the field. Okay. It can send to receiver one. And so if there are other receivers, so all of them, they can get the correction data from this base station to correct their errors here. Now, how it does is uh, rather simple. First, you have to have a DC station at a node point. So its coordinate must be known. Okay. And once you know its coordinate, actually you can compute the error here because you know the true value. And then you see so many satellites and you compute the position data. And then you know how much error is here. Okay. Now you have error information here. Then you need to break down these errors, whether these errors are from the satellite orbit, satellite clock, or atmospheric and troposphere. So all these things will be done in the receiver inside. And there are those receivers, they have a capability to do this by using different types of algorithm for RTK or PPP. You only need the data. Okay? So you have to send the observation data here to the receiver. Then this receiver knows how much error is there for each of these satellites, for the satellite orbit, the satellite crop, and all. And another requirement is that they should see the same set of satellites. Like this one is now observing 5, 22, 38, 10, 15. And this one also see the same combination of the satellites. Like 28, this receiver can see 28, but this one does not. So this receiver, this is satellite, sorry, not receiver. This satellite cannot be used for uh, differential correction to remove the error, okay? Because they, they don't see each other. So that means if you go very far away from here, the satellites you see will be different. And also the atmospheric and the tropospheric correction over here and over here will be different. Then you can't remove the error as good as when they are near to each other. So that's the reason the best length or the distance between this base and rover should be uh, less than 40 kilometer. Normally, this 40 kilometer is a recommended value. It doesn't mean that you should not go beyond 40 kilometer. Of course, you can go, but your accuracy will degrade. The, and the reason is that if you go very far away, the atmospheric condition, the space weather over here and here will be quite different. Uh, so this is the basic background, how we can improve the accuracy by doing this type of uh, differential correction. It may be RTK, it may be other things, but you do need this type of infra. And in the case of Indonesia, now Indonesia is a very large, big country, and also so many islands, so many small islands, also mountainous country and so on. And if you want to cover this type of system, the whole country, you need probably thousands of these stations to have a accuracy of few centimeter, then you have to have one in a radial distance of 40 kilometer. Yeah. And that will be a massive network of this station. Maybe, I don't know how many thousands you will require. Okay. At least 1,000 will be required. And also you have uh, islands. And it is not that easy to deploy so many stations to cover the whole country. And probably also don't need because some uh, places there are no people living. So probably you don't need it. But to do the operation and maintenance is very, very difficult. So that's the reason where Madoka can help. 
because if you use this RTK based better, you need a base station. Uh, it is for a small network. Every 40 kilometer, you have to have this one to cover the large area. Okay? Now, if we use a PPP or Madoka, you don't need a base station. You see here we have a base station and the robot. This is the receiver in the field or your your receiver uh, in the car or other survey tripod and so on. And here we don't have a base station, just your receiver. And the correction data, uh, orbit satellite orbit error and the satellite clock error. So all these correction data are coming from the QGSS satellite directly to your receiver. So you can use this correction data to improve your accuracy. Yeah. So this is the fundamental uh, concept, how, how Madoka or PPP can improve the accuracy uh, without the base station. Yeah. So the satellite in the space, like a QGSS, it can broadcast directly all the error values to the user. Yeah. Of course, to broadcast these error values, the QGSS system should have their own base station. Oh, QGSS has this type of base station somewhere, but you don't need to have your own base station now. If somebody has a few units of that, maybe not a 1,000, maybe 10, 20 stations in the country, those stations can prepare the data necessary for Madoka, and it can be broadcasted from the satellite to you so that you can have a very, very high accuracy without having uh, necessary, without having necessity of accessing any other base station like in RTK. So this is the fundamental difference between RTK and uh, PPP or Madoka. Yeah. So Madoka is just a, another name for PPP. It's a different way of doing PPP. So PPP stands for Precise Point Positioning Technique. PPP, precise point positive. And Madoka is one of the better to provide that uh, PPP service. And CLAS is centimeter level accuracy system. This is another service to provide the PPP, but uh, CLAS is uh, available only in Japan. Madoka is available in Japan and outside. So this is a sort of a global. And it, we can also use uh, in Indonesia. So we'll see this, how uh, this can be done tomorrow. Uh, actually, you can practice with the with the receiver. But today, also, I'm going to show in the with the demo here because uh, many of you will not be here tomorrow. So the main thing is that this QGS is broadcast the Madoka signal directly from the satellite to have a very high accuracy. So this is the basic difference between RTK and other high accuracy services. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So please remind me of the time, okay? Because we started, I don't know what time I started. Uh, we started late and now I cannot track my time. So just remind me. Otherwise, I'll be just talking. Okay, now there are so many applications. I'm not going to do go all this, but for Indonesia, uh, maybe transport related applications, I think is now in a lot of discussions I hear in Indonesia. So one thing is about the toll fee, how to use the GPS to collect the toll. So you can, you don't need to have a toll gates. You can use only GPS to collect the toll fee. That's one thing. And another one is ITS or smart driving, or and then also, of course, auto driving is a little bit far at the moment, but ITS and this type of toll fee collection is, I think, quite uh, interesting applications. And also many other, like uh, the, uh, this IoT related applications. Okay? And uh, of course, the drone UAV, UAV is very, very getting popular and uh, this agriculture and very important is the marine for uh, indonesia as well because you have a huge uh, huge uh, industry uh, 
uh, this type, uh, but there are lots of illegal fishing activities as well. So many boats coming from other places uh, getting the catch and take somewhere else. So how to control as bad is those type of uh, illegal fishing or the vessels is very, very important. I think GNS is the, one of the key technologies to be implemented in such a system. Yeah. So this is an example of Singapore, how they are going to do from the current system to GPS-based system. Now it's called the electronic road pricing, ERP, and this will charge the vehicle when, if you drive during the peak hour. Now to build this type of gate is very expensive and costly. So they want to have only GPS-based system, and that will be the future one, probably in the, in the, the in very near future. So this dynamic road pricing is one of the proposals we are actually doing, but uh, it's not yet started for Indonesia just to do some pilot projects or some uh, studies on this to see how this type of uh, toll gate or this can be implemented and see how it works, like a sort of a feasibility study, maybe one of the uh, proposal for good proposal for Indonesia. Uh, this precise farming, so I, okay, I, let's discuss it later. We don't have time today. And of course, this is very, very important for Indonesia, okay, the fishing boat monitoring. Uh, this is the example from uh, Bali. And okay, I will skip these slides. Uh, okay, so this is all. Okay. So let me look at the questions, what you have. How the time synchronized done to know the transmission time from the receiving end? Or does it use some kind of time step in the signal? Uh, the signal doesn't have a time step, but what it has is, uh, uh, we don't say the time is step, but uh, we 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 transmit the PR code and the navigation data, and that navigation data has uh, some time related time information somewhere in the data. So every like uh, I need to show you this one. Yeah. So this is a PR code, and we have a one one section of this PR code, and this is one millisecond long. Okay. Now in the receiver, actually measuring how many these pulses enter into the receiver from the time it starts counting. So by counting these pulses, it can find out uh, the time taken by the signal from the satellite to the receiver. Okay. So it can just compute the time delay. And then it can find out the time how long, what time it started and what time it ended by looking at another signal called the navigation message. There we have a sort of a time, you can say the time is time. We, we have some time related information in the, in the navigation message. So looking at that value in the navigation message and counting these pulses in the PR code, so we can compute the time or the time delay, all time related information, we can do that. Yeah, but you, you need to measure this one. So this is the main algorithm, I mean, uh, that are processing in the receiver technique. What is time offset? Uh, I don't understand what does it mean. Maybe this is in my slide, I think somewhere, time offset. So this is the, This one, I don't know. So if you are saying, is it this slide? Did I say time offset somewhere? Uh, yeah, there will be some yeah, time delay. Okay, because uh, the signal from the satellite to the receiver has to travel 20,000 kilometers. So that's a time offset or time delay or transit time when we 
try to do the correlations. Uh, but this this presentation, I'm not talking in the very technical signal processing uh, viewpoint. So if we discuss on that, we have more more on uh, this type of things. We come up with more how to calculate the time, how to calculate the poison data, how to calculate the shoot arrays and all. But uh, we are not doing all these technical things here because of just the 45 minutes. We probably need uh, several hours. So it is, is it related to the clock at the satellite at the receiver you were talking about? Whether, yeah, yes, that's, yes, that, that's true. <coughs> yeah, because the time stamp or time information that we get from the satellite signal is the, actually the count of the time from the day the satellite was launched. I think it comes from the 5th of January, 1980. So that time the satellite ticks as a zero and from there it's counting in terms of the seconds. And then these information are provided in the satellite signal. If you look deep into the satellite signal, how these are decoded, then we get all this time related information. And every pulse says of this on and off the peaks are very nicely synchronized with the atomic clock. So from the GPS, you get the most accurate time in the world. So that's the reason GPS signal or GNSS signal is used to synchronize many other network like the telecom, the mobile phones, financial transactions in the finance industries. So GPS is the signal, not only for pushing data, but also for timing data. How long does GNSS last? Wait, there are so many. <laughs> okay, let me, how long does GNSS last? Could it be used for three to five years or more? I mean, this is the satellite, okay? How long the satellite last? Yeah, the, the recently the current design of the satellite is I think their design life is about 10 years. In the past, that's, I think GPS was designed for seven years, but it actually worked, I think, twice of its life, even 10 years or 15 years. But the current design, like a QGSS, is a 10 years design life. So it lasts very, very long. Does the tool need to be calibrated annually? Are you talking for the receiver or the satellite? Yeah, but for the satellite, it's not annual calibration. This calibration is done almost every two hours okay, in general, because the, the satellite orbit is continuously monitored by the control stations of the, the satellite systems. And they have a different way to do it. Of course, they also look at the signal and also they have a laser scanning, laser raising to see how exactly the satellite is moving, whether there are some drift. And by measuring this type of uh, RV drift, so they are updating the navigation message to tell you the receiver, now the error is this much. So you, if you look at the navigation data, we call the navigation data, but actually it has the satellite RV error and the satellite clock error. And this RV data and clock data, they are updated every two, uh, two to four hours interval. Okay. So it's not, annually, but it's almost every few hours interval. Otherwise, the, if you do annually, the orbit will drift quite a large and you can't have this type of centimeter level of accuracy, it's almost impossible. So it's very, very frequent. And for Madoka and PPP, some of the orbit parameters are updated at a few meters interval. It's, that's why it's so precise. So it's very, very, very uh, micro level of observation of the orbit data and the clock data in the satellite side. Uh, does the tool need to be calibrated and only what advantage could we get compared with the prices? So typical piece of a satellite. What is the typical price of a satellite? Okay. You can get a, get a receiver that is about $50, $60. Even $10 receiver is available. 
but normally the receiver we are talking is about uh, $100, uh, 100 to $300. Okay? So the receiver that you will see tomorrow is maybe around $500 or $300. But also we have other receivers now being used at the UI to collect the data. It's about $100. So $100 receiver is now quite good to give you high accuracy of about one meter or better than one meter. So the error, is it red clock at the satellite receiver? Yes, basically, yes, the errors are due to the clock and also due to the satellite RV the four things, okay, satellite orbit error, satellite clock error, and atmospheric and tropospheric error. These are the four major errors. Most online transport providers are using Google Map and the smartphone for positioning. How different is satellite-based system than Google Map-based? Uh, no, I don't think that you can get a position data just having a map, okay? Like uh, in your mobile phone, actually it has a GPS receiver inside. So GPS receiver is working all the time. When you request for a location data in the iPhone or Android, first it looks, the it tries to get the GPS uh, position data by using the GPS receiver. And if it can't get the GPS data, like you are inside the building or underground, then it will try to use the Wi-Fi or other mobile phone signal. So the priority goes to GPS. If no GPS, it goes to other data like Wi-Fi. If no Wi-Fi, it goes to cellular data and the accuracy degrades. So you try this, go to underground area where you don't have a satellite, where you don't have a Wi-Fi. You just go underground, probably you don't get your position data, even if you have a Google. Because the, the device doesn't know at that time where you are and it will pop up the map, but it probably don't show where you are. Okay. Or it will show based on the mobile phone tower data at the accuracy maybe kilometers. You may be one kilometer far from the actual point. So without GPS, it's uh, difficult. So mobile phones, they use the combination of GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, and the mobile phone cell tower data, the combination of all these. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, multipath and interface are completely different. So this type of error we cannot remove. Okay. So multipath, it, it may be coming from the buildings, trees and all. So it doesn't help. So we can't do that. We can't remove it. Some receivers, they have a multipath mitigation technique to remove some large uh, reflections, but uh, it's up to the receiver and the technology like SBAS or CLAS or DGPS, so it doesn't help. So multipart is a completely different issue. And interference is, is uh, completely another issue that uh, you can't avoid. I mean, these techniques cannot, cannot uh, solve these interference issues. You know, it, it cannot remove. Okay, so let me let me just uh, manage myself. Until what time? How many minutes do I have now? I mean, this for this uh, presentation, next presentation at all. Now is two thirty. Uh huh. So I have half an hour for presentation, okay? And after that, we have a discussion. Okay. Okay, so then let me show you the presentation from uh, Professor Kubo. Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Or let. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Okay, let, let me show you quickly about the Madoka also, because some of many of them are not here tomorrow. So let me show you a very, very brief overview of Madoka first. And then I will go to Professor Kubo and then we'll have a discussion. I think we can do within 30 minutes. So just remind me of the time. So because this is uh, the same thing, okay? Now we talk this one. Wait, wait. <laughs> sorry. These are, okay. Now Indonesia, okay? So you are located here. So this just shows whether QGS is Japanese satellite is visible or not. So in your region is no problem at all. So you have a very good visibility of QGSS. This is one thing. And this we don't need. And these are just a comparison of the accuracies that you can get using different techniques or some special services. Uh, we are, so you will see CLAS in other presentation as well. Uh, but for Indonesia, we can use only Madoka. So Madoka is about 20 centimeter in your brace accuracy, but you have to wait about 10 to 20 minutes to get this level of accuracy that now we'll see the data. And because these are some background to understand the, this example from the slides under presentation from Professor Ko. And this report is the this early warning that you did last time. So this is also a special signal. Yeah. Uh, and this is the same thing how to get. So remove these two errors and you get the higher accuracy. So this is a very simple concept. And this again, okay, use the basic station. This we did. This is Madoka concept. Now, and this slide is showing that Madoka is providing the correction data from the satellite itself. Okay, Madoka, Madoka, Madoka. So we remove the orbit error, clock error, and some signal biases and then you get a high accuracy. So this is a very simple concept. And this is the receiver that you will work tomorrow. Okay. Now we have provided two receivers to you, I think. So you have a GNS Madoka receiver. And even if you don't have a Madoka receiver, you can still do Madoka by using the GNS receiver. If you have, you can get this Madoka correction data through our internet uh, correction service. We have, you can also access our server to get a Madoka correction. That means for Madoka, there are two different ways. Either you get from the satellite directly the correction data, or you get from the, from the internet. Okay? So if you don't have a Madoka receiver, you can get from the internet. So there are two ways to do this. And this we'll talk later, okay? the different types of software. Now the receiver, is like this. It's about six centimeter by six centimeter, very small. And this is the antenna. And this receiver that we had some question about the cost. So this is about, I think the cost is about $500, something like that. Okay. The modules and all, including antenna, that will have five to $600. Okay, so now I will go to the other part from Professor Kubo. Okay, so this oh, is this one. Let me know there are two. Oh yeah. Right. Okay, so this is for the low cost RTK, okay? they did a lot of work on the RTK signal processing technique. Now, this is the major difference. So this is based on the RTK. The word I'm talking is on the Madoka. So RTK, you need a base station. 
Madoka, you don't need a best station. Okay, these are the fundamental differences. RTK and Madoka. Now we'll see some examples of RTK, how this is used. And uh, this is showing some examples of the this uh, construction, like a huge constructions, like tall buildings, you have so many cranes and all. And during the construction, maybe some of these structures have to be monitored whether it's correct or whether it's uh, moving due to the wind or whether the structure has deformed. Okay? So this is necessary. And construction companies, they have been doing using RTK, but in the past, those RTK receivers were quite expensive and it costs a lot of money to do this. So they don't deploy so many units. Now the cost is getting so small, so cheap. And they thought maybe they can deploy maybe even for every pillar, like a one put here, 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 even they can deploy four. Now at the Tokyo University of Marine Science, they are doing a sort of a research to see how accurate it can be, the low cost system. Yeah. This is one of the uh, their work. And they have made uh, this type of a waterproof block, box. So put the receiver and everything inside and leave it in the site. And then you measure the uh, movement data of the structures. Okay. Now they did some tests, okay, non position, put it here. Uh, this is the base station, you see the base. And then you have a receiver, the rover is here, and then you log the data and find out how accurate is this. Okay. You see this is a five millimeter and it's very highly accurate. Okay. One, one centimeter, two centimeter. Uh, and then where is the actual, okay. So this is the actual device. You see the receiver here and the Raspberry Pi uh, receiver is here. Okay, This is receiver F9P, Raspberry Pi. This is a LoRa, uh, LoRa module to transmit the data using a LoRa signal. Okay, is this one, antenna for LoRa, Raspberry Pi, LoRa module and the uh, F9P U blocks uh, dual frequency receiver for RTK. And all these are inside the box. And this one is used to monitor the structure movement in the construction site. So these are just the system integration details. Uh, the, the UBX is the receiver output data. Then this is a software to process for RTK for high accuracy. And then the position data is output to other interface like uh, for monitoring in the web, web browser, in the email, uh, internet or like that. It can send the warning by email. So this, I will not go all the development, the interface details. Uh, yeah. Now, if the device, uh, this is how the device is monitoring. You can probably see uh, this is the okay the probably the time and the error in the horizontal probably uh, no it's all horizontal vertical and uh, x y z errors so this data is monitor and probably if this is uh, okay uh, there will be no warning or no. Uh, no message. If if due to something like uh, if it is moving, if some structure has moved, or if there is a lot of vibration due to wind, probably you will we'll see some peaks here. And during that time, if it crosses the threshold, so the system can send the email alert message to the manager or uh, some monitoring station. So this is uh, that type of system yeah, what they are developing to to monitor the uh structures in the during the construction time okay. uh this is all <laughs> all in japanese so uh, maybe if there's a summer movement like uh, i don't know what they actually want to say this but uh, i see that there is some uh, offset here so this type of things would probably they, they generate the message to from the server directly automatically to the monitoring uh, uh, center 
So this is, uh, we can see the lizard here displacement in the Y, uh, displacement in the X. Okay. So there is uh, some displacement here. Uh, this is just showing their, maybe this is during their test period, uh, just to put outside the building. And when you put a receiver like this, uh, this side, you, you can't get any signal. Okay? Only this side towards the balcony or this uh, outside, you can get it. So probably they would like to see how good it is to monitor the building movement as well. So if you want to do the tall building movement or the vibration, you can still do that by putting an antenna on the building wall. So when you do that, you don't see the satellites on the other side, but you will see the satellites only on the other half of the uh, sky because this uh, satellite over here is uh, blocked by the building's building wall. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. So here the, you can't see any satellite, so you have only data from this side. And uh, whether they have some data. Yeah, so I think during this test, so there are some uh, building movement. I don't know whether this is actual building movement or due to the antenna movement due to the wind. Okay, because this is not very well fixed here, just by this step. So probably, I don't think this is a building movement. But anyway, the concept is that we can do the structure movement analysis by using a GPS if we can have a very high accuracy. And this is with the F9P, means it's a very low cost receiver. Okay. And they are just trying to do uh, uh, some uh, uh, comparison between the between the different uh, techniques like original RTK engine means this is the RTK processing tool uh, inside the receiver itself. Uh, F9P has that type of RTK engine, so if it you use that one, it's okay. But in some cases, when you don't use it, if you just use the F9P without doing the, this type of uh, RTK engine, then you will have uh, this uh, error. Yeah, also we can use some other tool called RTK Leave at all. I think this one is showing that type of misfixes. So this is a not actual movement. This is just an error. Uh, it's actually not the movement, but the receiver is showing that it has moved it. So this is what they call it. Uh, we call it a misfix. Yeah. So some of these type of problems have to be removed. Yeah. So this is their observation findings. Move of RTK position. Okay, here's a video. Now you see data is coming here. Okay, so they move the antenna. Let's see. Is there anything? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So move means he is changing the height of the antenna. X, Y is same, he just changed the height. Now here, you see this is X, Y, and Z. Now he moved the antenna height by a few centimeter and we can see this uh, Z axis increased by a few centimeters. So this demo shows that even if you put the antenna in this type of a location, if you have a RTK fix, RTK solution, you can see this movement. Okay? This is to prove that this type of very small movement can be detected. You see, he changed the height. Uh, I, I don't remember. Uh, where is it? Okay. Okay, here. You see, he moved the height and data. It changes. Okay. 
Hmm. And he reduced the height now. Now he reduced the height to the original position and it come back to the same same level. X and Y is the same, but Z is now, you see. So this is uh, the experimental demo that this type of system can actually be used. And the system is not very expensive. It's just a few hundred dollars. So as in the past, you don't need a $10,000 or $5,000 receiver. You can do with a very small, uh price receiver so so they have developed so this is the conclusion i think this is the last slide uh, arctic engine for structural movement so you can put this type of uh, things in like if you want to do in uh where the constructions are going on, breezes or any type of things. So if you want to monitor the movement in the structure, I think this system will be quite, quite good. So this is one, and I think there's still, this is for the structure. And then there's one more. And this one. And uh, this is about the QGSS correction services that is available. Uh, and this slide now is showing the sort of a comparison between the RTK and PPP. So Madoka is over here. And uh, what type of correction will be done by different types of services for, from a QGSS. Okay. So satellite orbit error, satellite clock error, atmospheric and tropospheric. So these are uh, not done in the, it, it doesn't come from the satellite itself, but uh, CLAS uh, provides the, all the error correction from the satellite itself. Yeah. So if you have a CLAS service, you can correct orbit error, clock error, atmospheric and troposphere. But to provide this atmospheric and troposphere, they need uh, the CLAS service provider need to have a base stations, some reference stations of their own to generate this correction data for the users. Okay. So that's why this is not available outside of Japan. Uh, in Japan, there are so many base stations already installed, 1,300 stations we have. So using those stations, we can generate atmospheric and tropospheric correction data uh for the CLAS. But outside of Japan, so many countries they don't have that much of a dense network of the base stations. And that's why PPP will be very useful because you don't have to have your own base station now to provide the correction data. And this PPP, QGSS, uh, PPP broadcast the correction data uh, for GPS and GLONASS currently and if you want to use PPP in Indonesia, you can use the PPP uh, in Indonesia. So that correction data is valid for Indonesia as well or other countries. So in the future, maybe this may be available, but it's not yet available at the moment. So that means if you want to do Madoka PPP, you need a L1, L2 receiver, a dual frequency receiver. Uh, and for convergence time is how fast you can get very high accuracy. Okay. So if you have uh, this SLAS is uh, like SPAS, okay. this is uh, the previous SPAS system, DGPS, uh, and also for DGPS. So this is a convergence is for RTK is instant. So once you connect for the RTK, set up everything, so it will be within the maybe less than one minute or uh, maybe a few tens of seconds, okay? So this is that. But the CLAS will take you about one to two minutes, I think, one to three minutes, something like that. I don't know the exact value, but probably I heard, I hear one to, two, one to two minutes or less than three minutes anyway. 
But the PPP for Baduka, it will take uh, quite long. It's about 20 minutes in average, but maybe depending on condition, uh, place or antenna, maybe around 20 minutes uh, as per my experience. So tomorrow we'll see how it will take uh, for this convergence time to have a 10, 20 centimeter of accuracy. And coverage, this is a, like S bus, so all over Japan is available. And this RTK, I told you already that uh, you have to have a base station within 40 kilometer. So this is what it means, 30 to 50. So it average about 40 kilometer. Yeah. So if you want to cover the whole country, then you really need hundreds of those stations. Silas is all over Japan. You don't need your own base station. You just need to collect. Uh, get the uh, data from the satellite. And PPP is global, actually. So it, it can be used even if you don't see the QGS satellite. If you don't see the QGS satellite, you get the correction data through the internet. That's the meaning here, no limit means. It's, even in the USA, you can use it, although you don't see the QGS satellite. Yeah. So measurement is a code phase, the pseudo range, carrier phase, RTK, we must have it. Also, all these, we must have the care phase. And these are some examples from a different, uh, different applications for agriculture for automated tractor using uh, different types of receiver and different types of uh, observation technique. For example, SLAS, this is like uh, SBUS, and F9P is uh, the RTK. Yeah, this is another receiver from Septentrio uh, using the CLAS. So they compare between SLAS is for some meter accuracy. This is about 70 centimeter accuracy. F9P is a centimeter level of accuracy. This is also centimeter level of accuracy. I think they have a result here. Yeah. Uh, where is the result? Okay. So now the tractor is driven and see very straight, okay? So this is very, very fine data. I think this one is using, uh, I don't know which one. This is prior, ah, this is the RTK, okay? Post process RTK. Uh, so this is the RTK result and 100% fixed means the RTK is successful 100% time. And this type of thing is open sky. There are no other uh, objects that disturb the satellites. Okay? No multi parts, so it's very nice for agriculture. So the tractor goes, come back, goes, come back, and it's all automated. So this is the RTK, and this is SLAS. SLAS is a submeter accuracy. So if you look at here and here, maybe I. If they overlay the data, it's much easier to see. I think the SLAS accuracy is about uh, 70 centimeter, not even 30 centimeter. So this is a submeter accuracy signal. Uh, but for tractor, I don't know, maybe it's not enough for precise agriculture. They say 10 to 20 centimeter. It can't give 10 to 20 centimeter accuracy. But uh, nevertheless, if you drive it straight, so it's very much straight. Of course, we can see a little bit of this. And here we see the data, how much it jumps. Okay. LLH errors. So I don't know how they calculate the error for this. But anyway, this 20 centimeter, uh, this is the 20 centimeter grid. Okay. 20, 40, 60, yes. So this will be about 50 to 60 centimeter of accuracy. This loss and C loss. Now C loss is uh, similar to RTK. So it should give a very high accuracy of centimeter level. And I think we can see that about five centimeter. Oh, better. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is a five meter here. We, we should see here. Uh, Okay, up. Yeah, this is about uh, five centimeter. Yeah, yeah. This is the expected accuracy of CLAS, few centimeters. I think this one grid is probably one centimeter. We don't see the scale here, but I, I suppose this is one centimeter grid. 
So this is CLAS uh, and the Madoka PPP. So Madoka PPP is uh, not uh, accurate as a CLAS. It's about 20, 30 centimeter accuracy. And here, uh, now you see, uh, let me show you, this is CLAS, okay? The acquisition time, the fix rate, the ambiguity, uh, not ambiguity, the convergence time is uh, immediate, means immediately you get this type of uh, uh, accuracy, means you don't see the points jumping here and there. But for Madoka PPP, it takes some time to converge to the uh, accurate value. So that is, here we see, because in the beginning, you see it jump, okay? and then slowly it tries to converse. Yeah. So you have to wait, like, uh, for example, this data was long at 530, and then it starts converging. Okay? So this is a 550, about 20 minutes. So if you look at the data from here, then you see the convergence and they have a very stable uh, output here. Okay? Now here is a big difference from here. Okay. And th these points are these observation points. So it jumped and then it tries to converse, goes all the way, and then it's somewhere over here, okay. the final point. So this accuracy will be about 20 centimeter. You don't get few centimeter here. This is the Madoka PPP. So this will do tomorrow. You will be logging data and see how it looks like yourself. You will see something like this. So going here and there in the beginning for 10 minutes, and then slowly it converges to the uh, true value. Okay. So this is the uh, actual output data. So these four slides are, I think, uh, interesting to see how this uh, Madoka PPP, CLAS, and SLAS, and the RTK, uh, they look like. Okay. So RTK is best, but the problem is that you need the best station. And that's the costly. Yeah, you need to have uh, those type of infra. And do you know we had a very big earthquake day before yesterday night, midnight, eleven thirty-six. It was quite quite huge. Uh, so uh, very strong. Uh, so this is uh, I think this is a seismic scale is four in Japan. There is a different scale. But the rectory scale is 7.4 earthquake here, yeah. about 60 kilometers deep in the sea. And I, uh, my house is over here. I think at our place is five point something. Uh, and it was really shaky. The building moves like a, it's a week, about for one minute. Okay, It's just moving left and right. Uh, so it was quite shaky. And then uh, they put the GPS data here. Yeah. First, we got the, the shock, pre-shock, and the first move. Here is a, this is a normal observation. And then when we had the earthquake, so we had a first shock. So you see very large jump, and then it settles down, and then goes back. And after some time, again, then we had another shock. And this is lasted for quite long. And this, I think, I don't know how long it is, because it's at midnight. Uh, I'm not yet slept, but uh, because of midnight. So once it moved, we thought it will be always, it, we have that type of uh, earthquake so many times. So we think, oh, okay, it's just like other time. But that time was not like other time. So it really took uh, for quite long. And we can see how long it moved from this data. Yeah. So we can compute the duration from here. So this is, I think the GPS data, so we can see this type of uh, effect. And since they are developing for the monitoring system, GPS system for the this uh, uh, construction site, maybe the same thing we can also use for earthquake uh, monitoring. But we, we can know only when earthquake appears. We can't predict at the moment by using the GPS is quite difficult. Okay, so this is a very interesting result because the earthquake had we had just uh, two, two days before. Okay, so that's all. So what shall we do? Shall we have a break and have a discussion or please suggest?
Okay, let, let's do like this. Uh, so please send your questions in the chat. I will take uh, about five minutes break. Um, in the meantime, so you can think about the questions or you can write, start writing in the chat. So let me just take a break for a few minutes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Does a tool need to be changed? Okay. Please wait a response. Okay, that's the previous one. Is in to tsunami. Yeah, of course. Yes, tsunami monitoring. Uh, and also for water level height. 
So actually, for tsunami, it's not for tsunami, but uh, uh, for tsunami, one challenging part is that uh, uh, you have to separate the tidal wave by wind, okay, and the wave by the tsunami. So it's a very slow wave. Tsunami is very slow wave. And then you, you have a, a natural, this wind, the tidal wave by the wind. And also you have another wave due to the, mm, what called the, the moon and sun uh, art location of okay? every 15 days. So the art is near to, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, day and night day and night, the moon and earth, the effect, what you call, I, I, I don't know, the lunar impact on the, the greater, if you go to near the sea, the water level recedes and rise day and night. Okay? You can see by your eyes, so very big difference. So that type of waves, the natural waves, we have to remove. And that's one challenging part, how to do that. Actually, we are discussing this issue to use the Madoka for sea level rise monitoring in the, this uh, Asia Pacific region. And University of Philippines is already working for this project using our Madoka receiver. I don't know whether I had that slide in this one. Okay, so of course, yeah, tsunami may be a very good example and also sea level rise uh, measurement and also river water level moni monitoring is very important to detect or I mean to predict the flood. Okay, if you want to issue a warning due to flood, you have to predict when the flood will come. And then you can see if the water level rises above some threshold value, you can, you can issue a warning message. But you need to do. You need a measurement device, and GPS can be used for that. And then you can also do okay. What are the advantages and disadvantages of Madoka tools? Okay, so you saw already the advantages that it can provide you. Maybe where is it? This one. So maybe this is the uh, advantages, PPP. Uh, you can get high accuracy of about 20, 30 centimeter with a very low cost system without using the best station. That's the advantage without using the best station. Uh, but the disadvantage is that you have to wait for 20 minutes before you get the high accuracy. So that's the disadvantage. But that disadvantage that will be removed in future because the technology will not remain as today. So people are doing research. So every day they are coming up with new ideas. So how to reduce this time is one challenge at the moment. But this time will, I suppose this will reduce to a few minutes in the next year or something like that. Or we can do some other assistance. So you really don't have to worry about this. Uh, but some applications like uh, for transport, if you really need uh, instantaneous, very high accuracy, then this is not a solution. But there are many applications like agriculture, marine, and water level rise measurement. So this is not a significant issue anymore because for water level rise monitoring, you put the receiver all the time there and you, that 15 minute, and this is just a one time in the beginning, okay? Once you get this, you can move. You don't have to wait 30, 30 minutes every time. Just put the receiver on, you wait for 20 minutes, and once your data converges, then you can start driving. Okay? Otherwise, we can't use this for dynamic uh, situation. But if you put off the power and if you put it again, then you have to wait another 15, 20 minutes again. So that's what this advantage is currently. But you see here, next. So once we have this, so this time will reduce to few minutes, few minutes. So that's uh, advantage, disadvantage. Uh, what else is there? 
for like this is the only maritime sectors use maritime satellite and need very high cost for investment high cost for investors to analyze and predict the river current movement and what level accuracy for the river i mean the uh yes i think yes this is very nice application so for river only it's possible for using gns manoka to analyze and predict the river current movement and water level accuracy for the river yeah i think this is very very good example and it's it's possible it's possible and this is already now university of philippines the researchers they are doing it actually uh, i will show you the picture later what is the typical performance and accuracy degradation of rtk ppp for high speed rtk ppp rtk and ppp you mean okay so for rtk i i don't think the accuracy degrades even with a uh, high speed as long as you have a connection for the rtk so it should not matter for rtk for c loss should not matter as well it's almost similar thing but the correction data is coming from this space but pvp we really need to do the test because uh sometimes if we uh uh don't have uh, enough satellites to compute when we are moving then we have to wait for 20 minutes okay that may be one disadvantage here for Madoka ppp but i think for rtk and c loss there shouldn't be any problem okay? because uh for rtk there are lots of data so no no problem at all as long as you have continuous connection to the base station so this service must be available. And in such cases, we use a network RTK, like when you are driving, you are passing the base station from one to another. So now you can see base station A, after 40 kilometer, you have to connect to base station B. And this switchover must be done automatically. And the system should work with this type of uh, automatic switchover of the base station. So there are various types of services for that called the network RTK or virtual BRS, virtual reference system, BRS services or NR network RTK. Then the rover will automatically switching the base station. In that sense, you, you, you should not have any problem at all. And CLAS is much better in that sense because uh, you don't have to worry about which base station to correct, connect everything is coming from the satellite okay huh? okay Thank you. Okay. Yep.
Asia, with its vast and steady growth, has turned itself into the leader of global economy. Indonesia, with its strategic position, has the chance to take the major role in this era. In order to build global partnerships and counteract the threats, strategic policies should be taken to enhance the nation's competitive advantage, further approach through in-depth, comprehensive studies and researches are crucial. With our long history, has proved ourselves to be a reliable academic institution. After successfully adapting into distinct programs, in 2016, officially the program turned into School of Strategic and Global Studies. School of Strategic and Global Studies Universitas Indonesia contributes the cause by producing qualified human resources and studies. Situated in the heart of Jakarta, the School of Strategic and Global Studies provides a variety of courses on multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary studies at the master's levels. In my humble opinion, I can say that I have a good impression at the first sight. An atmosphere and ambience here support us to gain more and achieve more other than merely classes and handouts. I think that is a very promising because of the multidisciplinary approach that Universitas Indonesia offers us to study. For another reason, the situation Recording that stopped. I actually got in in the classes is a lot of interesting current issues that we're talking about, so it's academically fulfilling for me. With dedicated and qualified lecturers from academic and practical background, School of Strategic and Global Studies Universitas Indonesia produce scholars and practitioners that will ready for global challenges. Together, we build the nation for a better world.